This week on the WriterCon podcast. Write every day if you can, but find that block of time, whether it's one hour a day or one day a week or one hour, you know, every weekend, find that block of time and write. Don't let yourself say the muses are not with me or I'm not in the mood. Welcome to WriterCon, a gathering place for writers to share their knowledge about writing and the writing world. Your hosts are William Bernhardt, best-selling novelist and author of the Red Sneaker Books on Writing, and Renee Gutteridge, best-selling author of over 30 novels and screenplays. Hey there, writers. I'm joined today, as usual, by our sound engineer, Jesse Ulrich, and Renee Gutteridge, one of my co-conspirators on WriterCon, which is only a few weeks away now. I should mention that in addition to all the, you know, the teachy, learning, writing, craft, educational sessions, more than 70 of them, actually, we also give people a chance to have private consultations with an author, editor, agent, manuscript review, and to pitch to some of the finest agents and publishers around. As you might imagine, organizing all those pitches is incredibly complex which is I, why I always punt that to Renee. Renee, talk about this. Listen, we call this incredibly complex. I think it's incredibly complex for a right brain person. I think a left brain person would have this done in an afternoon. So, you know, you just have to understand the creatives are working on this. It's just a little harder for us sometimes, but we, we're getting it done. Hey, Jesse, I've also been watching all the email you've been exchanging with our AV people. You're <laughs> going to record each and every session, mm-hmm. right? And make them available after the conference to those who want them. Yes. Sounds like this might keep you busy. I don't know. Yeah, well, I, I, I was feeling confident about it until I discussed it with Michelle, who uh, pointed out my strategy of just letting the USB drives record all day might not be the smartest strategy, because what if one <laughs> of them's not working? So I yeah. will be running, or you'll be... If you're at RiderCon, you'll be seeing me running to the back of every room every hour or so just to make sure things are being recorded. Oh, you can duplicate as timekeeper. You can give people... That's the, right, yeah. Yeah, I'll be like, this. <laughs> be like, it's not even being recorded. You can stop talking. And live remotes from the RiderCon floor when you're not doing anything else, of course. <laughs> That's right, of course. <laughs> All right, our interview today is with the acclaimed author, Kathy Reichs. She, of course, has written the best-selling Temperance Brennan series, which, of course, was the basis for the Bones television series. Her first novel, Deja Dead, won the Ellis Award for Best First Novel and was an international bestseller. To date, she has written 22 novels featuring this forensic anthropologist who is based, at least in some part, on the author herself, because Dr. Reichs is in fact a PhD anthropologist herself with several scholarly articles on this subject to her credit. She's taught it, she's done it, she's one of very few forensic anthropologists certified by the American Board of Forensic Anthropology. And she writes best-selling books. I mean, how incredible is that? We will talk to Kathy right after the news segment. Jesse, take us away. Our first news story has to do with our friends at draft to digital You may remember on a previous podcast we mentioned that they had acquired selfpubbookcovers.com, which is basically a marketplace where self-published authors can buy pre-made book covers at a very low cost, and, and they're good covers. Uh, anyway, what... I didn't realize at the time was that this was part of a much larger expansion for draft to digital, which has been known as a distributor of eBooks primarily, but now they're starting a, what they call an author success division and author success will be headed by an employee and novelist, Nick Thacker. He's been working at draft to digital for some years now. So put this into perspective last year, draft to digital bought smash words now they've bought this self-pub cover company there they were and are becoming even more so a major force and resource for the self-publishing community 
and of course a counterweight to Amazon KDP. So there hasn't been a huge launch yet because this author success service is still under development, but the platform is up and running in open beta and they already have eight or 900 active users. You can sign up. New users are added manually. They are vetted first, but you know, in time, this service will become more widely available. And their goal, obviously, is to provide author-specific solutions to the various things all authors encounter. For instance, after cover, you might want to set up, a, you know, a newsletter, which means you got to have a mailing list, right? And you probably, in the past, people have used services like MailChimp. Well, draft to digital is about to offer that for you too. I mean, Renee, don't you wish something like this existed when you were first starting out? <laughs> oh my writer. goodness. Listen, there's a group of authors who were writing before the internet and then <laughs> the internet came and then we were writing after and we were like the, the, the I don't know, guinea pigs of all of this. And w- like they just threw us into it. They're like, Hey, you need to be successful on this internet website thing and good luck with that. Anything that has author and success and division. If even my publisher had had the author success division, yes, I would have loved it. I mean, we, we had to find our way through all of that and, and many of us not well in some areas. So um, yeah, that sounds like a fantastic idea to summarize my opinion. Once again, draft to digital is doing a real service for authors. All right, second news story, book sales update. For the first five months of this year, according to the Association of American Publishers, which, as we've mentioned before, favors traditional publishing houses, Amazon is not a member. Anyway, adult book sales are flat as compared to last year, and children's and young adult books fell in sales by almost 8%, which is huge. The main weakness appears to be in children's hardcover books uh, to such an uh, extent that Barnes & Noble has become reluctant to even stock those books because they're not selling and they end up having to return them. Similarly, a big five publisher, Hachette, has seen profits decline 16% compared to last year and they are also in part uh, you know attributing that to children's books circana book uh, book scan reports that sales of romance print books wait for it romance print books sales increased 52 percent 52 50 that's more than half again as uh, of an already huge number during the 12 months ending in May of this year. The press release that BookScan sent out says, quote, much of this growth can be attributed to the contemporary interests of new, younger readers with book talk and page-to-screen streaming TV projects leading the sources of discovery. I'm guessing like that uh, red, white, and royal blue movie that my daughter told me she was going to see yesterday, which of course is deriving from uh, fan fiction that became a book later. Jesse, how is it you haven't written a romance novel yet? Honestly, at this point, I I, I, I can't see why I shouldn't. Uh, <laughs> So maybe I'll give it a shot. Possibly think of a few, but it seems like a, a, a no lose situation. Okay, right? Renee, yeah. Renee, same question. How is it? I mean, some of your books have had romance in them, but mm-hmm. not category romances as such. Mm-hmm. You think that's in your future? I mean, that's where the money is. I mean, is, I'm apparently. with Jesse. The problem is I don't have a romantic bone in my body. I mean, this oh, would be so, so challenging Um, but I'm with Jesse and I, you may find both of us in the romance writing course we have at WriterCon because I'm (laughs) rethinking my entire life right now. And we should write, we should write one together, Renee. Oh, that's happening right now. It's happening. Yeah, and, we're and doing can, it. Can we live stream the planning sessions? Yes. <laughs> yes, it yes. will be uh, it if, will be crazy. If you give money, if you give money to the WriterCon Patreon, you get to see the live streams of Renee and I trying to write a romance. <laughs> trying oh, to write I'm a romance. Like that. Oh, I like that a lot. Okay, <laughs> oh. news story 3 finally. 
this was my favorite. Author says AI, artificial intelligence, is writing, I should put that in snicker quotes, writing unauthorized books being sold under her name on Amazon. And this then involves a friend, Jane Freeman, who, as some of you will know, has written many books and consulted working in the writing and publishing industry. And apparently it was not her, but one of her readers who found out about this and told CNN about it, uh, uh, specifically about new books being sold on Amazon under her name, except she didn't write it. They appear to have been generated by artificial intelligence. They look like something they'd write. They're in her wheelhouse. Were they titles? Were yeah. they listed like attached to her Amazon selling account? Like, well, I would assume they would link in since they're using her name. But, well, I, but I don't like, know. Well, if that's the case, like, who was getting the money from it? Well, whoever posted them, not Jane Friedman. Which well, but, is... well, but, but here, as someone who has helped people produce audiobooks mm-hmm. and even put ebooks up on Amazon, like to get attached to an author's name on Amazon, you have to also have their um, what is it, uh, ACX and other account the passwords. Yeah, combined. So, yeah, I like, don't know. Maybe it wasn't LinkedIn. Maybe it just looks like. Yeah, I mean, uh, it just looks like it. But yeah, I'm, I'm Jane Friedman. We don't need to go down that rabbit hole, but I'm very curious about how that got pulled off. So, <laughs> Well, I mean, it just, even if it didn't link with the other books, there's her name and the titles yeah, sound people like don't something she'd write about. But the text, she said, read as if someone had used a generative AI model to imitate her specific writing style. This is a quote. When I started looking at these books, looking at the opening pages, looking at the bio, it was obvious to me that it had been mostly, if not entirely, AI generated, end quote. And the worst part of this may be that even after this was brought to Amazon's attention, they were slow to respond. They, they all but had to be threatened with legal action before they would take these imposter books down. Good. So Jesse, yeah, I know, really. Jesse, you're our tech expert. How can we authors protect ourselves? It shouldn't be this hard. Like, there, I don't see the legal reason why Amazon, after a very short investigation, could see that this was not the case and take those books down. Uh, it's it's very much like if you've ever a problem with like a Google product or a Facebook product and trying to get their customer service on the line, you realize they have no customer service and you're just stuck in a you know support chat box hell for weeks. Um, I mean, author. I guess authors just have to either have somebody either themselves, someone who works for their publisher or whatever, just constantly checking to make sure that this is, doesn't grow too big because it's probably easier to nip in the bud with yeah. one book than is like 10 books. You, yeah, you would think. You would think. Who knows? Well, Jane, yeah. if you're listening, we here at WriterCon support you 110%. And if there's anything we can do, you just let us know. All right, Jesse, cue up the music. Let's talk to Kathy Reichs. Kathy Reichs, welcome to the podcast. Well, thank you for inviting me. Oh, thanks for coming. Okay, we have a traditional first question. If you could ask writers, no, if you could give writers one piece of advice, what would it be? Oh, write every day if you can, but find that block of time, whether it's one hour a day or one day a week or one hour, you know, every weekend, find that block of time and write. Don't let yourself say the muses are not with me or I'm not in the mood. You find that block of time and you sit down at that keyboard and you write because you can't edit a blank page. You've got to produce something. (laughs) That is absolutely right. All right. Well, congratulations. You have just released the 22nd Temperance Temperance Brennan novel. Is that right? 22nd? Yep. 22. See lurking over my shoulder, it's the bone hacker. So tell us what this one is about. This one starts out in Montreal. Tempe is in a small boat on the St. Lawrence River with Ryan. They're watching the fireworks. Montreal hosts the International Festival of Fireworks every year. And um, a storm comes up. They make it back to shore. Um, But a man is struck by lightning up on the Jacques Cartier Bridge. His body falls into the river. And the next day, Tempe is asked to help recover him and identify him. 
She finds he has a tattoo. She has it run through the FBI tattoo database and it links down to a gang in the Turks and Caicos Islands. She calls down and the detective down there says, I'm coming to Montreal. Tempe says, you do not have to do, nope. She's coming to Montreal. She shows up, she has ulterior motives. She wants to persuade Tempe to go back to the Turks and Caicos because they have a serial killer operating. Someone who kills, he targets young male tourists and he hacks off their left hand, so the bone hacker. But while she's there, the FBI becomes involved in the investigation and it turns out there is a whole entree into the world of cybercrime and spying and spyware mm -hmm. and hacking, the other use of the word hacker, into <laughs> um, software. Oh, nice. That's all I'm going to tell you. <laughs> That's fair. I, here's yeah. What I'm wondering is I hear you give this pitch perfect plot summary. Is it getting easier to write these temperance Brennan novels or harder? Uh, some things are easier. Some things are harder. Uh, <laughs> one of the harder, yeah, one of the harder things is you have to, this book may be the first book that a reader has picked up, but it may be the 22nd book that a reader has picked up. So you have to reintroduce your characters, your central premise in each book, but you have to do it new and creatively so that you're not going to board your returning readers. So I've done that by, you know, Temperance Brandon, forensic anthropologist, works for crime labs, works for coroners and medical examiners. I've done that by having her be in a faculty meeting and she's bored to death. So she starts writing her autobiography. <laughs> I've done that having her on the witness stand and she's being qualified as an expert witness by prosecuting attorney. And so it brings out all of, all of that information about her professional life. So that, that gets harder and harder to find creative ways to put that little bit into every book. We, uh, we should have Kathy teach a class on this, shouldn't we, Bill? Because that is that's one of the questions we get a lot from writers is how to do that. So that, uh, that's some, some technique that is learned, I think, over years and years of writing. Um, okay, so the PR for this book promises some rip from the headlines plot elements. Can you give us a hint? Well, the idea for this book, sometimes my ideas come from cases that I've worked on. The earlier books tended to rely a lot more on my own casework and my experiences in the, the autopsy room. Mm -hmm. This, Some of them are what we used to call in the writer's room, ripped from the headlines. Um, this one, the idea came from a story, an expose, rather lengthy expose in the New York Times by Ronan Farrow, and I can't remember his co-author's name about um, NSO and Pegasus, which is an extremely powerful spyware software. Mm -hmm. And it was created in Israel. Um, it is a no-click spyware, which means the user of their device, their phone, for example, doesn't have to click on anything. It can get downloaded into their phone without them having any knowledge of it or any involvement, um, even if it's unknowingly. In it. And it can be used to spy on by governments to spy on um, hmm. their citizens. And the United States government was thinking of buying it for a while. A number of go governments have purchased it, but in the end, they chose not to. But it got me thinking about, wow, what if some nefarious villain out there creates a spyware that's able to do that, that's able to be dropped into people's devices and can be used for whatever purposes? Wow. That, that's, and I did remember reading um, that. Uh, I follow Ronan. He's a fantastic journalist. So um, interesting. So, okay. So the next question was about being on top of recent scientific breakthroughs. Um, in any additional scientific breakthroughs in the book as well? Um, maybe any forensics or anything else? Oh, well, there's always forensics. <laughs> um, I try to put a different aspect of forensic science in each book because I don't think my readers want to read about bones after bones after bones. After bones. So of course there are bone clues in, in the yeah. writer's room for the TV series. We always had to have X number of bone clues and she had to do her bone whispering. 
things. So there are, of course, bone clues in there, like the impact of lightning on, on you know, someone who's been struck by lightning. What, how does that impact, impact their skeleton? Oh, gosh, um, it's hard. You know, I'm so immersed in writing book 23 that I've got to think back about. <laughs> oh, I am, totally understand that. We do. Uh, yes. Yes, there will definitely be some interesting forensics. Well, in you've already piqued my interest with how lightning affects bones. So <laughs> right. that's enough for me. Quit with that, Kathy. I, I, I read about this on your website site. Tell everyone about the Know My Bones campaign. Know My Bones campaign. Gosh, that was years ago. Oh, really? Okay. Well, you want me to ask about something more recent? <laughs> I got a t-shirt that said Know My Bones, and I was the spokesperson for, I think that was for the National Osteoporosis um, Promotion. Kathy, I know you've been involved in a lot of charitable activities. Can you tell us what have you been doing lately in that? Sort. Well, one of the more recent things I've done is I went on a USO tour to Afghanistan and mm. Kyrgyzstan, them. one to Afghanistan and Kyrgyzstan, and the other one to Cuba. It was a small group of writers. There were five of us to Afghanistan, um, Sandra Brown, myself, Clive Cussler, Mark Bowden. I think there were five of us and somebody else. Um, and we went to, to thank the troops for their service, and they spent their whole time thanking us. So it was a really moving experience. So in the next book, when I got home, I was about to start book number something. So I sent our character to Afghanistan. Oh, wow. So, okay, shifting gears a little bit to the writing process. Um, we have, of course, a lot of writers that uh, listen to our podcast, and they always want to know from big shots like you, <laughs> are you, first of all, a pantser or a plotter? I'm more of a pantser. Um, I do a little bit of outlining. I think about it a lot and the pieces kind of float around like minestrone soup in my head. The plot, I mean, the, the, the science I'm going to use, what the crime is going to be, how the body is going to be discovered, what the main characters will be, the periphery characters will be, what the setting will be. Eventually, all of that congeals into what will be the storyline. And I do some outlining. I will outline maybe six to eight chapters with just a little paragraph in each. And then I just start writing and I know how the book will end. Um, I don't know. I, I write murder mysteries. So it's a bit of a formula. Somebody gets caught and somebody gets killed for doing the deed. Um, and it's, a, it's, they're different in that the solution is science driven. So I know what science will yeah. be brought to bear on, on the question of who done it. And then I just start writing um, sometimes I don't even know. I know how it will be resolved, the crime. I don't always know who the actual villain is until I get much closer towards the end of the book. Well, that's fun. That's what we pantsers like to hear because that's part of our process is discovering as we go. So in, uh, in your writing day, what, what does your typical writing day look like? Are you a morning writer, evening writer? What beverage must you have etc i'm a morning writer i can't my son is also a writer oh and is he a plotter i mean he has big mm. whiteboards and color-coded cards and every character every scene every i don't do that um but he works at night too he'll he'll start at like 11 oh. at night and work until four in the morning i uh. cannot do that i'm a morning i mean i don't fire out at dawn anymore when i wrote the first <laughs> book i did have to do that because i was teaching university full-time right. and commuting between the Carolinas and Quebec doing forensic casework. So I had to squeeze it in. I'd get up at dawn and I hated it right for two hours before going onto campus. I don't do that anymore. I try to get at it mm, 8.30 ish. And then I have coffee in the morning. I fill my mug and drink one mug of coffee. Um, and, you know, I quit around 30, 2 o'clock and then do other things. Well, that sounds fun. Um, so, how do you handle research? Um, and, you know, in particular, staying up to date on uh, the, all of the things that you have to stay up to date on, which is changing um, very rapidly with technology. Uh, does it take a lot of time? Well, I, as a general course of activities, I stay in contact with my colleagues. I attend the annual meeting of the American Academy of Forensic Sciences. 
I get online with a Zoom call every Wednesday night with six forensic anthropology board certified women who are forensic anthropologists. I read the journals. Um, so I'm not at a loss for ideas um, for storylines. That answer your question? And then I do the research. I do a big chunk of research before I start to write. When I've decided I'm going to use blood spatter pattern analysis or mitochondrial DNA extracted from animal hair, whatever it is I'm going to use. I contact, I'm lucky that I am in the field. So I have colleagues that I know in the different specialty areas. So I will set things in motion. I will contact someone I know who's a specialist in hair and fiber analysis or whatever. Mm. And then they will send me, I will get very, I'll do my research. So I have reasonable questions to not waste the time, but then they're always willing to help me and send me so that I have that in advance when I get to that point in the writing that I don't have to stop and wait. Um, also, as I'm writing, I'm constantly researching. It's a feedback all the time. Every little thing as I go, I'll have my character driving, you know, along St. Catherine Boulevard in Montreal and have her make a left. Wait a minute. Can she make a left on Peel Street? Well, I'll get on Google Earth and I'll check it out or, or Waze or whatever. So I constantly check everything as I go. Which is just smart because so, you know you'll hear about it if you can't make a left turn there, right? Absolutely. <laughs> or if in an earlier book, I've had a character with green eyes and they're back now and I say they have blue eyes. Nope, Oops. you'll hear about that. <laughs> Uh, I wanted to just point out to our readers something very uh, important, I think, that you've said, Kathy, which is how do you prepare yourself, even being an expert in the field, you prepare yourself well before you reach out to colleagues or other experts yeah. so that you have knowledgeable questions that is not wasting their time. You're not asking broad-based questions like, how do you do this? Exactly. You've researched and then... Yes. Because yeah, I get exactly. questions like that. I'll get a really broad question. Would you mind telling me what forensic anthropology is? Uh, yeah, I'd mind telling you. Go out there, go to the website, and then come to me with specific questions, and I'm happy to help right. you. Right. Well, I, I'm, I'm guessing that PhD in anthropology gives you a leg up, too, plus all the years of experience in teaching, right? That's true. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I mentioned to you, we're getting ready to put on our annual writers conference. So we're very concerned, you know, making sure we invite the right people and give people the right information. But perversely, I'm going to ask you, what's the worst piece of writing advice you've ever heard or been given? Oh, I won't say this was bad advice. Okay. Steve King, Stephen King once told me, just get it down, get it down really quick, shove it in a drawer, go away, and then come back and edit it. Uh, it's probably good advice, but I can't write that way. Mm -hmm. I have to polish constantly <laughs> as I'm writing. And I, I think that comes from when I wrote the first book, Deja Dead, I had no publisher. I just decided I was going to write a book and worry about, you know, publishing it when it was finished. So I had to have that manuscript absolutely as perfect as it could be before. And what I did is I just blind mailed it off. In those days, you mailed off the whole hard copy manuscript. So I think the habit of constantly polishing, editing, editing comes from the fact that I began um, writing in that way. Yeah, that makes <laughs> a lot of sense. So at this point in time, you've done 22 of these Tempe, as you called her, books. And you've done a standalone, and I know you've collaborated on books with your son. So this has been a long and very productive writing journey. Are there any tips you've learned along the way or things you didn't know that when you start that seem, you know, of vital importance now? Oh, gosh, I, I was unaware of how much promotion is involved yeah. in the publishing industry. You know, I thought you wrote your book and you sent it in and you got editing help and then they put it out there and then people bought it. Right? I had no idea <laughs> how much travel and although there's less travel post pandemic, I think right. we need a lot more um, of this kind of virtual uh, promotion. But that's yeah. the thing I think you don't you're not aware of until you, you get into the industry. 
Right. Well, I think that's a great answer, too, because I know a lot of people listening are probably thinking, oh, my gosh, Kathy Reich, she's a huge best-selling author, and she's had a television series. She probably just sits in her pajamas typing all day and doesn't have to do anything, but Wait. turns out, no. <laughs> <All right. laughs> well, what are you working on next? What can we look forward to? I'm working on book 23 in the Temperance Brandon series. It is tentatively titled Fire and Bones. It's set in Washington, D.C., and it starts out, not surprisingly, with a fire, with a number of fatalities in the fire. And will there be bones, I'm guessing, later? About the impact of fire on bones. We're going to learn a lot about the history of the Foggy Bottom area of um, D.C. back in the, in the, uh, the 20s through the 50s. Mm, sounds mm. fascinating. Can't wait yeah. to read it. Yeah. Kathy, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Really appreciate it. Oh, thank you for inviting me. Hey, Renee, my favorite film of 2022, I have to say, was <laughs> Family Camp, which I think you had something to do with. What's going on with that movie now? Hey, you know what? That wasn't a romance, by the way. It's a buddy <laughs> film. So no, you would have made a lot more money. <laughs> I know. I don't know what I'm thinking, but I, I, um, I don't know. I don't think romance films are doing well. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, books. well books. in any case, it got nominated uh, for a Dev Award for Best Wonderful. Feature Film. So we're excited about that. We're in good company. Jesus Revolution is one of the other ones, which I thought was a fantastic movie. So uh, anyway, that was, that was exciting. Yeah. Congrats. And of course, you know, I'm going to mention RyderCon because as this goes out, we've got something like three weeks till it happens, September 1 through 4th. That's Labor Day weekend in Oklahoma City. We have dozens of best-selling authors, a terrific roster of agents, probably the best we've ever had, publishers, much more contests, manuscript reviews, all those things Renee's handling because they're incredibly complex. You can even get a great author photo for free man at writer con we do it all and if you didn't believe me before let me just say two words food trucks yes food trucks so you know it's going to be a party sign up for writer con if you want to know more about it visit our website which of course is writer con w-r-i-t-e-r-c-o-n dot c-o-m all right until next time Keep writing. And remember, you cannot fail if you refuse to quit. See you next time.